Audrey, today is the Dalai Lama's birthday. Happy and birthday. I thought we'd happy birthday. I guess he's something like 845 years old, or depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought we'd start with a quote from him. Uh, the future is very large. And I wanted to throw another philosophy at you, see how you react. Mm -hmm. It's that uh, infinite diversity in infinite combinations. Does that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds very familiar. That's uh, it's a it's a Vulcan thing. Mm -hmm, yes. I wasn't sure how deeply into Star Trek you were. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, I am really like uh, the Star Trek worldview, uh, in that there's real collaboration, uh, not just like um, like people in extraterrestrial um, skins, uh, but uh, doing human things, uh, but actually like fresh perspectives across uh, true diversity. And I think that is one of the perspectives I want to bring uh, through my work in the uh, digital or plural um, ministry, because in Taiwan, plural and minister uh, and digital minister would be the same words. Plural and digital uh, is both written as Shu Wei. Very good. Um, I want to touch on a philosophy for a, a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, cruising through your stuff, there's Lao Tzu, there's Confucius, mm -hmm. there's Ubuntu, Victor mm -hmm. Hugo, mm -hmm. Seven Generations. Mm -hmm. uh, you touch on ancestor stuff, calling yourself a good enough ancestor or mm -hmm. you're striving to be a yeah. good enough ancestor. Mm -hmm. Is there a central core of philosophy that you can point to that is that is yours, mm -hmm. perhaps above and beyond anarchist, which we'll get to in a minute? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I, I would call it plurality, right? Collaboration across diversity. Uh, I, I wrote in my job description, um, we hear singularity is near, but the plurality is here. So what is here and now is the plurality. And what did you mean by singularity there? Singularity means uh, foreclosing other possibilities, right? Ah, very good. Um, what would be a definition of anarchist for you? Uh, not giving orders, not taking orders, voluntary collaboration. I, I loved, I love this definition: the abolition of all unjustified hierarchies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Sure. Um, your father, just a, a few personal notes. Your father was intimately involved with Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, was and your mother, yes. and your mother was a teacher involved with Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And they both seem to have, uh, a, a, you know, profoundly directed your your life. What did your father's involvement in Tiananmen Square pique your interest in this kind of real time communication, coordination, and collaboration? Was that did that mm -hmm. play in? Yeah, I mean, uh, the the difference between Tiananmen and pretty much any other social movement before that is that it's the first movement that has been covered by digital photography. Uh, footages, right, the tank men and all that. Uh, and it allowed a global perspective uh, on things. It's like it's happening uh, with an immediacy. Uh, and we are uh, watching from afar, worrying about my dad, um, uh, actually feel the uh, sense of co-presence of uh, something like we're, we're, we're there, right? Uh, this year we've seen uh, like the uh, Ukrainian uh, situation, uh, the, the assault, the annex, uh, attempted annexation uh, of Ukraine, um, compared to the, the uh, pre-internet digital photography uh, era, um, like we felt that much more closely compared to the places where there's no internet coverage and so on. So um, Tiananmen, I guess, to me, I showed uh, uh, journalism. Uh, there's one thing about just writing about it, whereas there's another thing about this immediacy uh, in journalism that brings everyone in uh, into the, the square, so to speak. Very good. Um, for a minute, you brought up Ukraine. What? what kind of job do you think uh, Mikhaila Fedorov is doing as the Ukraine's digital minister? He's in a very mm -hmm. difficult position and he's sort of adapting Telegram mm -hmm. to any number of purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very difficult position. Do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts about mm -hmm. his situation? Well, not, not just Telegram, but also Dia, right? They uh, already had a uh, app, a, a kind of uh, citizen's wallet. Uh, that doubles as uh, public participation, but also holding of uh, driver's passport, vaccine certificates, and so on, before uh, the pa 
pandemic. So in a sense, they're uh, well equipped uh, to bring the citizenry uh, into what we call a all out uh, mobilization. Uh, there's also the more lighthearted uh, parts like you can stream Eurovisions uh, on Dia uh, to boost people's morale uh, and, and so on. But at the end of the day, uh, it showed us that it's not about this authoritarian emphasis on efficiency. Authoritarians may be very efficient at making mistakes uh, but and, and committing to it, uh, but the, the democratic <laughs> resilience uh, relies on uh, apps like Dia and before the uh, Prozara, which is their public procurement uh, website and all those open government movement is not just about bringing more effective or efficient uh, governance model. It is also about resilience and this democratic open source intelligence in the times of conflict. You call yourself a digital migrant mm -hmm. and you were incredibly young mm -hmm. uh, when you migrated mm -hmm. to the internet. Could you talk about that a little bit about what what mm -hmm. drove you to that world and what you found there and how mm -hmm. you grew into it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't quite call myself a, a refugee, uh, but <laughs> it, it's something <laughs> like that. Though. When I was 12 years old and I just got this heart surgery, I, I could barely move. I was just uh, recovering from this this major open heart surgery. So because of that, uh, there's a, a a lot of limitation of what can I can do uh, in the physical world. I've been like for eight years before the surgery uh, told that I may or may not uh, survive uh, to the age of surgery. So, uh, so it's a, a little um, difficulty uh, in the analog world. Whereas uh, in the digital world, we're um, not bounded by the physical distance that I have to travel, right? So if I have a friend that is many many um, time zones away, nevertheless, if I just adjust just my sleep patterns a little bit. Uh, we can be um, literally neighbors uh, in the same um, time zone, in the same uh, circadian uh, time zone, and then uh, working on synchronous uh, collaboration very quickly. Uh, so to me, uh, I think internet brought to me a new kind of kinship, a new kind of tribe, people who care about swift trust, put the internet um, trust instead of uh, losing that trust and so on uh, very quickly, regardless of their original time zones or disciplines or culture or even languages, uh, very quickly quickly become very good friends. So uh, that's my, my tribe, I guess, when I migrated in. And how old were you when you came to the United States? Um, uh, well, uh, as a visitor, um, quite young, but uh, to stay there in a significant um, period of time, I think it was when I was 17, 18. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I then toured around the world, including staying uh, for quite a few months uh, in major uh, US cities uh, in 25, uh, 26, 24, 25. Yeah, so that was back in, uh, I don't know, 2004, 2006. So th there's a lot of tech talk we can get into, mm -hmm. but the the real miracle magic mm -hmm. alchemy that you created manifested mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. continue to uh generate mm -hmm. is trust mm -hmm. um i sat with a friend of mine who is tech savvy mm -hmm. and really got into the whole contact tracing thing that you mm -hmm. did with COVID. Yeah. That was an astonishing mm -hmm. things. And understand that a lot of this stuff will be covered in our show notes, so we don't have to sure, sure. backtrack to explain sure, sure. a lot. But so I said, okay, we've got QRs, we've got SMEs, we've got mm -hmm. uh, using the phone companies, we've mm -hmm. got uh, numbers that vanish. Mm -hmm. And here's mm -hmm. even a court case where somebody mm -hmm. was could prove that this person had was involved in this crime, but they threw it out because you mm -hmm. couldn't do it. And they just said, I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, you see this, you see what he did. I drew it out yeah, on know, paper. So, so somehow mm -hmm. you were able to create mm -hmm. trust. I mean, I'm sure you didn't sit down and dis discuss, dis you know, the ledger thing, you know, mm -hmm. blockchain and all that to people. I would like you to talk about the string of trust moments mm -hmm. that you were able to create and maybe it starts with the sunflower revolution mm -hmm. and there mm -hmm. you are in the corner with 300 feet of ethernet mm -hmm. creating a conversation in real mm -hmm. time with 500,000 people in 20 organizations but that to me is the real magic and if you could just address the creation of the trust mm -hmm. to where it is now because you've managed to leverage these moments to to keep sort of opening and opening to broader and broader applications to bringing Taiwan to your ranked, if you're ranking these things, you're ranked 11th. You, 
from 31st to 11th in the Economist uh, Democracy Scale. So if you could address that notion. Yeah, we're now the, the, the first and foremost uh, democracy in Asia, according to Economist. This is a very strange feeling. Um, and <laughs> because I was born in a dictatorship uh, in a martial right. law. Right? Um, so, yes. so, so really, it's not about me. It's about, uh, I would say, it's a model of Taiwanese plurality where we, we celebrated um, ideological differences and then uh, just co-created something that works okay for, for everyone involved. There's no um, like bloodshed uh, in our peaceful revolutions toward democratization. Uh, we welcome uh, all sort of different uh, like pro um, a more libertarian uh, individualist view of things, uh, but also a, a very social democrat uh, view on universal health care, um, like human right uh, protection uh, and labor uh, movement, uh, the various uh, gender mainstream movements and so on. They were all part of the Sunflower uh, Occupy, um, 20 NGOs, um, not sharing a lot of constituency, uh, just, just occupy the parliament together. So back in 2014, uh, if you uh, hop to one corner of the occupied parliament, you'll be hearing a very different conversation in the other corner of the occupied street. One corner may be talking about a 4G network, Huawei and ZTE uh, and, and things like that, core uh, telecommunication network and, and so on. But the next uh, corner is talking about queer theory <laughs> and then how like the, the cultural diversity is having strength and the risk being um, you know decimated if the publisher uh, all come from more authoritarian backgrounds, fund funding and, and things like that. So it's a real cross-pollination uh, of the views uh, on a, well, a trade deal certainly, but on the aspects of the trade deal that people care the most. And it's these moments uh, when the moments of care amplify through uh, professional facilitation, nonviolent communication, open space technology uh, into the digital realm so that it can spread cross-pollinate to people who previously didn't care about those things. Suddenly, it became a moment of trust, as you said, uh, because people uh, found that, oh, it's it's easy to, to start trusting uh, each other to take good care about the aspect that I do not know a lot about in this uh, trade deal. And so, which is why after three weeks of Occupy, with the 300 meter uh, cable uh, and all the uh, co-presence work, uh, we managed to settle on a set of rough consensus, uh, coherent 40 months, not one less, uh, that was then ratified by the parliament. So it's important to note here, when, when I mm -hmm. talk about this to other people, they mm -hmm. assume that Taiwan is like Estonia as mm -hmm. a, as a harm, as a, as a uh, homogeneous single, single culture, culture, but no. it's not at, not at all. Incredibly diverse. And as you said, mm -hmm. there's a generation that grew up uh, as I don't know if you experienced the G28 incident mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. white terror, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of kids that, you know, there's generational, huge mm -hmm. generational differences, mm -hmm. indigenous peoples. So mm -hmm. to create that trust across this plurality, this very, uh, very diverse society was mm -hmm. quite a feat. How much, uh, if, if I may, how much mm -hmm. do you think uh, that the trust has to do with you? Mm -hmm. Do you think, mm -hmm. do you well, think that it was like, yeah, Audrey Tang is doing this, so I now trust this. Uh, no, I, I, I think uh, very. I think you're very being little, modest. Very little, um, because uh, I, I mean, all, all the social fabric uh, was already there, right? Uh, certainly, I wasn't the reason that we've got twenty national languages, right? Uh, that was the Ministry of Culture's work with uh, many of the indigenous and uh, Dai and Hakka uh, populations, and but that directly translates, for example, in to when we do our marriage equality work, um, because in the 20 national languages, there's matriarchies. There are, uh, the Taiwan nation doesn't care about gender when choosing the successor of the chief and, and so on. So, so there's a, a plurality of models uh, that were not caught into this binary thinking. And uh, I really think that uh, the international community really just anchors uh, this plurality uh, thing on, on me because uh, I'm very conveniently non-binary, <laughs> so non-binary in all things. Uh, so so kind of a, a <laughs> proof of existence uh, that it is possible to do the impossible, right. which is to reconcile the, the binary uh, like worries, right, about your friends who uh, probably think 
that uh, you know enhancing privacy and uh, effective contact tracing and surveillance is a binary uh, that you cannot reconcile. You have to choose between one and or the other. Some compromise uh, instead of through privacy enhancing technology actually make both sides uh, grow better. So I may very convenient figure ahead, but I don't think uh, really those 20, 30 years of tradition have a lot to do with me personally. Uh, the distributed ledger sits under the hood with so much of this mm -hmm. stuff, and mm -hmm. it's not clear how far it can go. How much, mm -hmm. how much farther do you think you can ride distributed ledgers? Can they really mm -hmm. do the, there's a lot of hype there. It'll do for the transmission of assets, what the internet does for the transmission of information. Mm -hmm. And you have distributed ledgers at the heart of a lot of what mm -hmm. you do. What's mm -hmm. your, what's your take on that? Sure. Um, distributed ledger or polycentric uh, ledgers is already the backbone of pretty much everything, right? Open source mostly runs on Git, uh, which is a polycentric uh, distributed ledger. Uh, the collaborative documents uh, that we all use uh, based on operation transformation or conflict-free replicated data types, that's a distributed ledger uh, and not a chain, uh, but a cyclic graph or whatever, right? So, so I mean, this is already a fundamental data type of of today, uh, because we, uh, thanks to the distributed ledger, see for the first time uh, that the the uh, anti-rival goods, the the things that gets more valuable, the more you share, um, doesn't have to be pegged on a rival good, a scarcity like a bounded book or a CD or uh, something uh, that is um, tangible and rival, right? And you don't have to put a lot of digital restriction management, or rights management, but really restriction management uh, to, to make it a uh, pseudo rival. So uh, I think this is already the, the zeitgeist. Now, if you're talking about decentralized uh, ledgers, uh, Bitcoins and, and so on, of course, it seems that currently the use is still mostly in places where the fiat, the existing institutions fail. And so when, when you want to get donations across to Ukraine, they're, they're very useful in that case because the uh, institutions that are polycentric uh, kind of crumbles uh, in such situations. So I think it's a very good uh, fallback, uh, uh, fail safe. Uh, but whether truly decentralized ledgers can and should um, augment the distributed uh, system of polycentric governance, I think that need to be evaluated on a case by case basis suddenly uh, when doing civic participation across jurisdictions or you want to get to some sort of um, common good uh, like uh, funding allocation across like incommensurable interest and so on. Uh, these uh, are the places where this decentralized paradigms become very useful because you do not have a bridging institution to service the distributed uh, distributor uh, of the ledger. But again, that needs to be evaluated by the very Austrian uh, like uh, case by case, uh, layer by layer uh, approach. It's uh, comes all the way down and maybe some layers is distributed and some layers is decentralized. So let's sit with this trust idea for a moment. So mm -hmm. you've gained this trust. There's a successful mm -hmm. nationwide conversation mm -hmm. about this trade deal with, with the PRC. Yeah. And then uh, there's a there's a whole process where that's done. It's peaceful. The students cleaned up mm -hmm. after the demonstration, which was a mm -hmm. nice... Uh, and then uh, yeah. your previous uh, digital minister, ja Jacqueline mm -hmm. Tsai, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if I'm yeah, saying that Jacqueline right. Tsai. Yeah. She, so she's watching you mm -hmm. do this. And here's mm -hmm. a trust moment where she's saying, this person knows things and can do things that I mm -hmm. cannot do. Mm -hmm. And she reaches out to you. And there's mm -hmm. this process where you are sent out to find a digital minister mm -hmm. and you come back and say, in all honesty, it's mm -hmm. it's me. Can you mm -hmm. boil down those moments mm -hmm. for us and sure. and with that idea of of mm -hmm. trust kind of fitting its way into because she did she mm -hmm. have to give up power uh it's two different moments uh the first moment uh you uh pointed to was around the second half of 2014 uh, where indeed she invited me and a bunch of other gov zero uh g0v civic hackers uh to be her reverse mentor uh, meaning people younger than 35 who point out new directions to a cabinet minister, uh, but uh, it's in a partnership position. It's not like she actually gave up 
power, but she did um, delegate a lot of those power uh, into the facilitators uh, in situations uh, like the UberX example, the Airbnb example, many other examples. So that's right. the 2015 uh, moments of trust. It's a uh, not directly citizen control. It's not a devolution of any kind, but it is a genuine uh, partnership, I call it people-public uh, partnership, and then private sector joins later. Uh, but the second moment you pointed out was 2016, uh, and it, it's not Jacqueline Tsai uh, anymore because Dr. Tsai, another uh, Tsai, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, is in power uh, in May 2016 as our uh, president. So uh, her uh, premier, uh, Ling Chen, head of cabinet, did um, just um, ask me whether I would like to help uh, finding someone like uh, Jacqueline Tsai who could be a digital minister for the new cabinet. Uh, and then I asked my friends and they're all busy with their business and so and uh, I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe I can do it. Uh, and I think these two are, are really bridging moments because Jacqueline Tsai uh, and her premier uh, Simon Chang uh, and Lin Chuan uh, they're they're nonpartisans or, or pen partisans. They're they're really not uh, strongly affiliated with any particular party's candidates. So they were able to do this very peaceful transition and create a remarkably pen partisan zone uh, that is open government, so that all the four major parties nowadays sign upon this agenda and compete in a uh, pro social way, like being more transparent, more participatory, uh, instead of uh, just you know saying that oh this is a um, a blue thing, this is a, a green thing, or we don't do that in the topics of open government. So um, now you're at the position where. Mm -hmm. You are walking this, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term of it, an eddy line, it's in a river mm -hmm. where you have uh, the, you know, one stream is the river's going one way and the eddy's going the other and there's this line in between them mm -hmm. where all this kind of craziness is. Mm -hmm. So we've got this clean, beautiful mathematical language mm -hmm. on one side and screwy human beings mm -hmm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. And you are trying to figure out, you are bridging that gap. I, I'd like to read a couple of your quotes at this mm -hmm. point. Sure. <clears throat> Our shared values are hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. It's both an art of communica human communication and the science of service design. Mm -hmm. And his, here are my favorites. We adapt technologies to the values and structures we already trust. Mm -hmm. Taiwan has put online collaboration at the core of its governance. Mm -hmm. The idea is to bring technology into the spaces where tech citizens live rather than expect citizens to enter the space of technology. Mm -hmm. The premise is this, the government must first trust the people with agenda setting power, then the people can make democracy work. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, any further thoughts on those statements? Well, I, I mean, all these are very you know, trust intensive, right? Yes. Uh, lines of work. Uh, it's not capital or labor intensive, it's, it's trust intensive. And without a certain threshold of trust, the contact tracing system 192 to SMS simply right. is unimaginable, right? It's simply outside of the, not just the overtone window, it's outside the realm of imagination. Um, so um, I, I think it's not about thinking of human beings as messy or mathematics as beautiful and clean because I don't know, poetry uh, to me is, is also simple and clean. And uh, there's a lot of different um, lines of thoughts, epistemic thoughts, uh, lines of traditions. And, and I think the messiness only comes when you want to dominate with one, maybe very instrumentalist, utilitarian, or deontological, whatever. You, you want, want to begin with the worldview, and then you see the other worldviews as messy, uh, because, well, they don't conform very well to, to your map, right? They have their own maps. Uh, but if uh, your worldview is simply plurality, uh, collaboration across diversity, you celebrate the diversity, and you optimize for the mutual trust, uh, and then suddenly everything becomes very simple, and nothing is messy. Everything is the way the way it is. Is the, the Tao follows uh, what it is, right? The Tao follows the natural. So, uh, well, that, that brings up that wonderful story with your grandmother and the ATM. Mm -hmm. I mean, here you have a situation where mm -hmm. you have technology that can work, but your mm -hmm. grandmother's going, hell no, I'm not going to do that. And you go, okay, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's too far of a trust thing. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a, definitely a dance between what's the most, the mm -hmm. straightest line mm -hmm. between two points technically mm -hmm. and what people will accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I think it's it's about the norms. Um, much as um, the the so called um, artificial or authoritarian intelligence um, worldview want to maximize this kind of data first approach, right? Just yield to the data. The data produces the code, produces the norm. Everybody just conform to what the data said. Uh, or uh, the as I mentioned, the decentralized individualist um, like uh, the code uh, says says. Um, that a, a Bitcoin cannot be double spent, and I, I trust only that, and not any of the norms of the institutions, uh, which means the code should set a norm, should set, then collect the data. Uh, I think what I'm advocating is the, the other arrangement of things, uh, where we begin with the norm, and the norm uh, determines the code, which then determines the data. And in the example you just outlined, it is the norm of my grandma and my grandma's uh, friends of a similar age, 80s, uh, 90s people. They, they trust enough maybe the ATM to give them cash, but they do not trust the ATM enough to send money out to deposit uh, it disappearing into the machine uh, or to uh, mistype and then your their whole savings gone right they 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 they're, they're okay with atm as a, a cash uh, dispenser but they prefer to spend cash uh, so that they know uh, exactly how much is being spent uh, you, they can count on it like literally uh, count on the coins so uh, so so i mean this is very very visceral uh, and and it's it's nothing uh, that that we can just write right off right so uh, then we design the process with them nothing about them without them uh, where they use the universal healthcare card which they know cannot be used commercially uh, get this receipt and they use that receipt to pay in cash uh, over the counter and they they feel very safe uh, and of course uh, the staff at the counter in the convenience store may um, you know <laughs> have to pay extra attention and work initially but because the 90s uh, people teach the 80s, people teach the people in their 70s and their 60s, you end up with the network of advocates that distributes uh, this knowledge. And so, uh, paradoxically, you do not have to spend a lot of resource to so-called bridging the digital gap because there's no gap anymore if the norm is there. Right. So uh, you've just brought up, I'd like you to dig in a little more mm -hmm. on the whole relationship, you know, the inverting the data to the code. That was, a, there are two fa uh, Facebook stories I wanted to touch on, mm -hmm. and that's one of them. Can you outline for people what the difference is between writing uh, code to the data and writing mm -hmm. uh, the data to the code? Because it's a very important mm -hmm. distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. So um, the, the idea of a data-driven coding uh, is that you do not have to um, have this intention of the the justice, right? Uh, if you think about the code of law, uh, a lot of the design of the court system and the code of law uh, is about this intention of justice. Uh, if things go wrong, there is a trustworthy way to get um, a reconciliation or redress or things like that, right? There's this whole justice uh, system with significant uh, public participation. I mean, the jury system and, and so on. Uh, but um, if you say data first, uh, then that means that you trust whatever is, um, is commonly held uh, as uh, the, the bias or the stereotype. Basically you're saying, uh, then the stereotype is right. Uh, and the judge could be automated because most of the time the judge just conform to the case uh, precedent anyway. So why don't we just automate away that particular uh, stamp uh, and then uh, just say, you know, if the machine says it's right, if the statistics says it's right with all its biases, then it must be right. Uh, but then it shifts the burden of seeking justice from the entire system into just a few who were previously underrepresented in the collected data. And they, because they were already probably uh, quite vulnerable to begin with, is less likely to appeal uh, to this um, inequity. Uh, and so it basically reinforces whatever inequity there is, but actually uh, painted that as normal because now uh, data determines norm, determines code. Uh, so that that is, of course, a, a very different interpretation uh, of code and of justice that we uh, nowadays see in the most authoritarian 
um, societies and jurisdictions uh, where uh, if the, the data uh, says that you are a green coat, then you can enter a building. If the data says that you're a red coat, you cannot enter a building. But sometimes, you know, this red coat is not because you caught a virus or you got into contact, but just because some local um, government official doesn't like your petition ideas and then they, they recorded you, right? <laughs> and so uh, the data first one, uh, it makes the distance between a inequity or an injustice situation into seeking justice like very, very long because it's a indecipherable uh, algorithmic language uh, between uh, your pain uh, caused by the system uh, and uh, the actual uh, redress required. You have to navigate the algorithm uh, that is produced by the data, which is unlike the people written code, the uh, algorithm written by the data is uh, more often than not indecipherable. There you go. Uh, the other uh, Facebook story is when mm -hmm. some of the major platforms came in around a presidential election, mm -hmm. you somehow negotiated without, mm -hmm. you know, breaking out the, the iron fist, oh, yeah. saying we have utter transparency here. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to play Google? We need to know where your money's coming from. Mm -hmm. We need to know these things because that's how we that's how we do here in mm -hmm. Taiwan. It's the norm. Here. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, so mm -hmm. Twitter did not. And. Mm -hmm. Google did not, but Facebook did. So I was wondering if there's some maybe uh, mm -hmm. anecdote in that story, what those negotiations were like, and if they point towards, uh, mm -hmm. so is there any number of stories about these massive uh, mm -hmm. corporations that say no, 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 but when they're forced to, mm -hmm. they very quietly in one corner or another mm -hmm. say, well, yeah, of course we can do that. Yeah, so what I was think, that like? Yeah, yeah. Google eventually joined, I think, on the accord. Uh, and Twitter uh, voluntarily uh, disclosed those uh, coordinated, uh, inauthentic behaviors. But globally, uh, w without saying that Taiwan made us do it, so I, they, they they respond differently. Uh, but but Facebook uh, actually also didn't say Taiwan made us do it. It was one of their whistleblowers after they they uh, quit the civic integrated team said that Facebook uh, at the time twenty nineteen only paid significant resources in the very few selected jurisdiction that there's a real chance of social backlash, uh, and and so on. So uh, I mean, um, right? Well, which in in a sense is. Uh, a a kind of vindication right of our known first approach without uh, as you mentioned an iron fist we basically said uh, just look there's a real uh, possibility of you facing a social sanction if you do not do what uh, even our government already agreed to do which is publish as open data to empower the investigative jour journalists uh, that all the spendings uh, toward the campaign uh, cannot be masqueraded as uh, just social and political advertisement it must not be funded by the extra um, judicial sources just like our campaign donation and it's not like it's our government position uh, those activists hacktivists occupied our control yuan uh, and brought out uh, xerox uh, photocopies of those printed uh, freedom of information uh, printouts and reverse engineer that they run this otaku uh, character recognition campaign ocr uh, to to massively parallelly made it a game to to reverse engineer uh, the campaign finance and and so on so it's not like we had a choice our people uh, virtually demanded it. so if you don't do that um, beware something like that may happen to you uh, and, and so I think this uh, really is quite different uh, uh, compared to many other jurisdictions ways to handling uh, the relationship with the multinational platforms because uh, they previously uh, were if they're doing this top-down way there's always a, a possibility that the people can be played against uh, this regulation because the big right. tech is also pretty good at manipulating people's emotions but if we first say that you know this transparency stuff is actually a, a direct result of people's outrage uh, then we are already at a co-creative relationship with the people who already have this uh, trustworthiness surplus and then it's very difficult for the multinationals in a trustworthiness deficiency uh, to start a kind of uphill trade negotiation vis-a-vis uh, -vis this kind of uh, collective demand so this kind of negotiation, the rough consensus, I love mm -hmm. the term, mm -hmm. um, there are some zero sum issues, though. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the whole the, the way you resolved uh, gay marriage. Mm -hmm. It's uh, bylaws, not in laws. Mm -hmm. That's a really that's a really perfect little negotiation of saying what really are your issues here? OK, so we're not marrying families. Here's mm -hmm. what we're limiting 
this union too. Is that okay with everyone? So that was what a lot of people would say, there's a zero sum issue that you nicely negotiated mm -hmm. through. But I mean, sometimes a bridge gets built or it doesn't, a pipeline gets put in or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Have you run into a situation where you, where you just, somebody just had to say, hey, I'm the president and we're doing this? Mm -hmm. No, uh, I think that the difference is just the bridge that's built and the bridge that is under construction. Uh, but all websites are under construction, right? So I mean, it's not like the fact that we're we're still inching toward uh, reconciling uh, the different worldviews. Um, this proves uh, the those uh, bridging attempts, right? We we came quite close uh, in 2018, 19, um, where the um, not necessarily the president, but certainly the the many legislators feel kind of impatient of our very contact tracing like way of doing fact checking uh, on the online social media, right? Uh, they they are basically saying that um, it's it's going into community spread now. If you're still doing contact tracing, you cannot uh, eradicate or eliminate this virus of the mind. You have to do a lockdown, basically. And, and by lockdown, I mean administrative takedown. Uh, they, they were pointing at right. some nearby jurisdictions uh, where the Minister of Justice or really any minister can simply force a, 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 a post down. Uh, but but I, I pointed out two things then. Uh, first is that it actually fuels the conspiracy theory. It's not like uh, Facebook uh, is the only public uh, sphere. There's many public spheres, civic infrastructures. And even if you um, issue the takedown orders to, to everything uh, that you, you can see, there's still things that are end-to-end -end encrypted. There's still underground networks. Uh, you mentioned Telegram, right? Uh, and it's very unlikely that we can actually issue takedown notice that affects the Telegram and WhatsApp and signal of the world. and, uh, and result is just like um, the, the old, bad old copyright uh, files uh, where people then find it, you know, uh, habitual to break the law just because they want to torrent something, right? So so then then it's it's not a, a, a good site for, for each and everyone. So which is why we built another bridge. It's not just about fact checking, which is like contact tracing anymore. Uh, we, we focus then on humor over rumor. Uh, on packaging the clarifications with an even higher transmission rate that is just hilarious. Uh, and then people after laughing about it build antibodies in their mind so they don't spread as conspiracy theories anymore. So notice and public notice, very important, but humor over rumor is the bridge uh, that we got across, which bought us some time so that we are not uh, forced uh, by the ruling party's legislators or other legislators in the parliament to adopt a lockdown or takedown uh, approach. So that that was pretty um, close. Uh, but just like we fought off the pandemic now without a single day of lockdown, we end up proving that this is actually not just possible, but desired. So let's stick with the humor over rumor mm -hmm, uh, sure. for just a second. Mm -hmm. So in terms of you want to, if you want to apply our values to mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to this situation, mm -hmm. what uh, the people I'm sure you 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 I saw your podcast with Tristan Harris and mm -hmm. um, and you know the uninvited detention, and mm -hmm. what's become clear is that moral outrage is incredibly contagious. Mm -hmm. And was this a conscious decision on your part that? that humor is perhaps mm -hmm. equally contagious and mm -hmm. the best way to fight moral outrage in terms of mm -hmm. our values and people or are do you like the uh the mm -hmm. fast fair and fun thing are you just mm -hmm. kind of a fun guy and that's just how this yeah I, I i already said optimize for fun uh right back in 2005 2006 that was that was my slogan right it was this whole pro six uh later raku of movement and still it's uh, I mean, just a few days ago, I was installing the, the latest Ubuntu uh, Linux, and uh, I think in the second screen or something, it says that Ubuntu is optimized for fun. I'm like, oh, okay, my philosophy. Right? So, so uh, this, this, this meme, optimized for fun, obviously, uh, to root in the free software community, and uh, uh, just by saying that we're optimizing for fun, uh, that was a conscious uh, technique, like uh, troll hugging, right? Hugging the trolls. Uh, again, we have in the Pro Six Now Raku uh, channel a bot that just hugs 
the trolls. Uh, so the, <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, people doing their work do not have to spend all their time on this intimate uh, <laughs> relationship thing, right? But but a bot hugs hugs you, right? So anyway, so so uh, whenever you you do something trollish, so so I mean this again took the outrage away. Uh, you know you you hear me say. Uh, troll hugging or the hug, but you laughed about it, and the, this whole trolling thing suddenly become kind of dealable, right? You, you're not afraid, right. you're free of trolls anymore. Uh, so yeah, I think this is the the power of humor and optimizing for fun. I've been advocating for that for for a very long time, uh, even before joining the the public service. Yeah, you well, you hired comedians. One of the oh, first no. thing you did that yeah. was that was absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Let's make mm -hmm. let's make people laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, how are we doing for time? It's uh, seven fifty-one. Nice no, I don't have anything. I can go on for hours. Oh, great. Uh, well, well so, anyway, um, uh, for half an hour, but yes. <laughs> um, very good. Uh -huh. Thank you. So, to me, uh, in in order to get the capillary action mm -hmm. of people participating, mm -hmm. that there's real magic in real time, mm -hmm. that people can see their the their impact, their action, mm -hmm. things are manifested. They mm -hmm. buy a mask and they mm -hmm. see that number drop one mm -hmm. on yeah. their everyone's looking yeah. at the same data and i love the phrase a country in constant dialogue with mm -hmm. itself yeah so a couple more quotes in addition to lowering the barriers to democracy this approach is also a process of mutual understanding mm -hmm. when the public sees results of collaboration it leads to more participation only through this cycle will it be possible for citizens to provide concrete feedback and even further by applying adjusting and contributing to the civic civic uh, tech community. Mm -hmm. So you're forming shared goals. So there's something once you, this is the magic. This is what I keep trying to understand is you broke through a barrier. And mm -hmm. once people tasted that, so if you're mm -hmm. jumping into Plato, it's, it's how do you get people to, mm -hmm. in the cave analogy, how do you get people to turn mm -hmm. around? Well, Audrey would say, Hey, give them real time feedback. Mm -hmm. So that would start to turn the people around in the cave. Mm -hmm. The other quote is, Everyone can participate in the democracy in the here and now. See and feel for yourself in it, not a ritual that's practiced every two or four years, something that is continuous practice every day. So any any thoughts mm -hmm. about that before I ask specific questions? Certainly. Um, so, well, I, I'm not being facetious when I say this conversation I can hold uh, for four hours because I, I really don't have anything in the next hour or two. So uh, we'll see how oh, long no, it takes. I'm... Yeah. Thank you. Okay, right. So, so back to this. Um, yeah, I think uh, of our new ministry, Ministry of Digital Affairs. Uh, the logo is Moda, uh, M O D A, uh, which means in Spanish or Italian, fashion. Right. So, so in a sense, this uh, fashion work. This is bringing something that's uh, avant-garde, that something is cutting edge. But then uh, suddenly, people just starting to put on pink masks uh, because the the that's central a great story with the kid in the pink mask right awesome central story. central epidemic command center or oh, oh, this is so so the boy that put on the pink mask suddenly is not the ally uh, is suddenly at the avant-garde right uh, the, yeah, he's the, the coolest guy now yeah for four fronts of of fashion uh, and the, the other boys have to rush to to somehow find a uh, pink mask at least until the rainbow mask become very fashionable but anyway so so that increased uh, what we call MPI, non-pharmaceutical intervention, but it doesn't feel like an intervention anymore. It's become a, a symbol of pride, symbol of self-expression, uh, and, yeah. and so on. So it's like a collective card game. Suddenly, Beautiful. A, suddenly you have to collect all the uh, seven rainbow colors of masks uh, to complete the set, <laughs> and so on. And people <laughs> were just, just putting on masks as a show of, of pride, as a show of uh, expression, not a, a show of obedience, right? Which is, uh, I'm aware that in the US during that time, uh, early 2020, it was very much centered on, oh, does it mean that I'm on mute or things like that? But in, in Taiwan, it's the other way around. It means that I'm expressive. So um, one of the, uh... What is the the largest real time conversation that mm -hmm. you've been able to hold? the mm -hmm. The five hundred thousand people with the sunflower rev mm -hmm. revolution was mm -hmm. astonishing enough. But what? Mm -hmm. How large is that expanded? Where you're holding an ongoing 
Mm-hmm. I mean, is it the whole country now? That it's can... a whole country. Uh, and uh, oh, during so uh, amazing, the mask rationing map has been uh, uh, applied to also rapid test rationing and so on. Uh, and the app to that power stat, the National Health Insurance Express app, um, is I think installed on at least ten million uh, active users. So even more phones <sighs> uh, in the country of twenty three million. So that's like literally half of our, our active population. Uh, and a lot of them just use it to participate in in ultra right there's a function that says if you don't collect your mass quota you can click to dedicate that into international humanitarian aid for our foreign service to send to people so around cool. the world uh, and at least like seven million pieces of musk were, were collected this way so yeah we use that for all sort of public participation i love that uh, the policies phrase uh, mm-hmm. uh input crowd output meaning mm-hmm. That's a lovely phrase. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you work fairly closely with them? Is that an ever evolving situation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're we're in constant contact, uh, and it's not just on a application level, uh, but also on a kind of um, theoretical level. Because the the main insight of Polis is that uh, it should be resistant to simple mobilization where thousands of people just join to vote exactly the same. Uh, in voting right. system, in voting system, we talk about clone proof, but it's uh, the clone of candidate, right? <laughs> we're, we're now here talking about the clone of participant, which is like the Sybil attack uh, in distributed ledger <laughs> uh, community, right? Attack the clones. Uh, and, and so uh, to be resistant uh, on that, your measurement must go beyond uh, one person, one vote, or just counting the headcounts. Basically, if 10,000 people join and they are of the same head, uh, like just one head and the rest are headless, I don't know, zombies, bots, right. Uh, right, then then, then it shouldn't count at all, right? So, so the main insight is that you have to increase the plurality, the degree of collaboration across diversity. If you just reiterate the same party lines and people join both exactly the same, they're probably a bot because this polis is a very high dimensional space each sentiment, each uh, statement, each uh, re- resonance with a uh, feeling or opinion is one dimension. So with 99 uh, contributed statements, there's 99 dimension. Uh, in those high dimensional spaces, all everyone is very individual and the distance is very large. But if you see a very close cluster, they're probably bots. They probably shouldn't count. Uh, and so right. in, in, in this way, we basically say, um, if you cannot convince people in the, all the other clusters in that galaxy of this high dimensional space, uh, then it is, just counts as one vote. Uh, and so this core insight has been then applied by uh, Vitaly Buterin, uh, Pooja, Glenn Wang, so right. in the decentralized uh, society paper, which is unrelated to polis as a utility or tool, but it is very much related to polis as a philosophy. Yeah, uh, incredible. Uh, th- and this, uh, the detail that this hones down into, again, the, the, the alchemy of getting people to see themselves mm-hmm. in these massive conversations, mm-hmm. and, and that's, that's dashboards. Do you have anything mm-hmm. you'd like to say about about the subtlety and evolution mm-hmm. of how somebody can see themselves amidst a million people and go, that's me. I, I know mm-hmm. that's me and mm-hmm. I recognize myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there's a, a real kind of you are here right moment uh, in, in, <laughs> in the dashboard. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm yes. Waldo. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes, and and I mean all of you. You are all of us, <laughs> uh, uh-huh. and and it's a uh, perspective vortex, uh, right? So, uh, in a pro-social way, right? So, uh, I, I think the the point I'm making is that uh, you are here, but this you is a plural view. Uh, so the plural you means also that you uh, as a intersection of all the communities that you belong, you identify with, uh, as much as you can say that the people constitute communities together, you can also say those communities collectively constitute you. So you is the plurality of the communities you are in. And by doing this, polis give community first class citizen status. So unlike, for example, corporations, which is a fictitious person that enjoys just a subset of human rights. Um, the 
communities phrased like this. It's much more like natural personhood in the uh, Maori or Taiwanese indigenous thoughts, right? The rivers, the mountains, the spirits uh, are already there. They are already persons even before human become persons. Uh, and then uh, their interests uh, must take at least the same priority uh, as the humans. So we become the stewards of those larger than us persons. And so it's not just I am here, but also the community, including those long life spirits that uh, constitutes a uh, part of me, uh, we're all here together. Uh, and that is the you are here moment. Excellent. Um, one of the uh, one of the phrases you, you mentioned, and it's difficult to mm -hmm. um, articulate is, is mm -hmm. the people closest to the suffering have the most powerful voice. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that boils down to quadratic voting mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. but how do you how does that i mean that's an incredibly uh, uh compassionate and and again where people see themselves they feel like they're part they they're a part of this they're mm -hmm. in there's no alienation mm -hmm. how do you how does that work that the people closest to the suffering mm -hmm. have the greater voice mm -hmm. yeah uh I, I think this of course is related to quadratic funding and so on uh in a sense that uh it seeks to to raise the less fortunate to the uh, one half power, right? The, the uh, square root uh, power, but without getting too mathematical, I, I think the intuition here is very simple. Um, if you are the intersection of all the different communities, then it must be more often than not that you are in a position of privilege in some of the communities but your community or you in the communities are in a position of vulnerability in some of the communities. So each and every one of us have some part uh, that is in the place of suffering, but each one of us also more often than not uh, have some parts in us, in the community so or the, the communities we enjoy uh, that is in the position of superiority. Uh, but the problem uh, of the traditional low dimensional democratic process is that the parties or the political uh, counting uh, basically encourages this linearity of projection so that there's only one or two most divisive issues and it's only your strong sentiment on that particular issue count to the detriment to the points that you also want to make that you are in a less fortunate position but you probably have to vote for this party because they advocate your primary um, objective right. along this dimension you're and thing. so on right. you're one thing right uh, so so uh polis or any high dimensional democratic process including quadratic voting and funding is about saying no we have this high dimensional space and uh, bridges are easier to build once you have higher dimensions uh, and the people's unique combination of experience of your suffering on one side but privilege on the other side can complement very well with people who are suffering on that side but privilege on this side so it's natural for you to coordinate uh, there's a natural anti-rivalry between both of your positions and it's between two of you that those bridge narratives uh, can be discovered that you both care about the sanctity of marriage, uh, right? The long-termness of commitments is just that one cares about family values and one care about human rights, but these two can be reconciled. Uh, and then you build bridges across this, and then you empower these two people closest to the pain, to the benefit of everybody involved. Wow, that's just brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the, the goal is so obvious and the path is so uh, considered. Mm -hmm. I mean, nicely done. So still with this idea of just getting people hooked on it so you no longer you know the engine's running you no longer have to you know you've got this thing going mm -hmm. and so now the whole idea of reverse procurement mm -hmm. is absolutely brilliant that's almost the final hook mm -hmm. it's you have kids in schools you have a situation where if you come up with five thousand mm -hmm. signatures on a petition you automatically get that meeting with the that's cabinet right. member mm -hmm. you've got uh your hackathon your presidential mm -hmm. hackathon there are any number of pathways for people to get ideas into the government, but what do, is there a next step there? Mm -hmm. Are you, yeah. is that something mm -hmm. that you're developing and you have a next yeah. thought? It's like, okay, there's a next step here. Yes. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, I I just yesterday uh, gave a public or well, not a lecture conversation uh, with the academicians uh, in our national academy. So the very brilliant people in their fields. Um, and then uh, one of them pointed out that in this people public private partnership, the researchers are not a natural part of this because everything I said was about delivering state and civic capacity to respond to the emergencies of our times, the challenges, which is all well and good, appropriate technology, co-creation, but there are something that must take a very long horizon to realize. Uh, and from this point, maybe it, it's not until 2040 uh, for people to see a inkling of social application, but yet they, the academicians, the leading researchers, they are thinking at least on that horizon or even right. longer. So this co-creation, which is a short horizon, um, like one year or even like just next week, uh, is great, but it doesn't get us out from the local optimums. It, it gets us very quickly to the auto local optimums, which is to be um, recommended, uh, but it doesn't get us out really from the, 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 the valleys, right? So, right. so th that's, a, that's a great point. It, it's a really good point. Uh, and then I, I committed uh, just yesterday then uh, to, to do another, uh, non, not presidential hackathon. Presidential hackathon runs from uh, March to September every year. Uh, throughout the six months, right, we've got quadratic voting. Even this year, Ethereum Foundation is probably um, considering right now to join in via quadratic funding and, and so on. So it's got a real ecosystem going on. Uh, the, the private sector in the uh, people party private partnership is, is well into the fold. But after the September, where we've got the champions that maybe realize in the next fiscal year, maybe we start a, a longer idea thon that targets not 2024. But 2040, uh, and then yes. the the participants will be leading researchers, coupled with science fiction uh, authors, uh, coupled with people who can do immersive experiences and movies. Like let's just live in that future for a few moments, right? It's like um, like. Uh, Gibson, uh, living in virtual reality for just five Love minutes. Love his stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So that, that, was, that was before the engineers solved the VR business right. problem. Yeah, but, he was the first. Yeah, but but that was that, that brief glimpse is sufficient for him to say, oh, uh, yeah, we'll just be, you know, jacked into <laughs> this system uh, in, in a neuromancy uh, style, right? Uh, in, in, in like X years from now, decades from now. So so this uh, bridging the future, uh, I think the field is called speculative design, uh, must be given its own six months uh, stage uh, so that they are not captured by the service design of today. Service design, very important, but right, because, speculative design, equally important. Right, because as you pointed out in, in your marvelous conversation with uh, mm -hmm. Yuval Harari, mm -hmm. it's the same technology that's being used in North Korea, mm -hmm. that's being used in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So you're mm -hmm. looking to the future and trying to sort mm -hmm. of future-proof this involvement yep. with people, and yep. that's, so, mm -hmm. that's so wise. Mm -hmm. um, here you are, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. look, look, are you surprised? Mm -hmm. Has there been any personal surprise when you mm -hmm. started this? You're sitting at the Sunflower Revolution mm -hmm. and you're having these thoughts and you're thinking 40 years ahead. Mm -hmm. But what along the way ha ha did you accomplish that you sat back and went, oh, mm -hmm. I can't believe that worked. Mm -hmm. This is so mm -hmm. cool. Was there, have there been any things that mm -hmm. surprised you mm -hmm. that worked? Yeah, or that I, didn't work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was very pleasantly surprised. Uh, when the contact tracing system um, actually got the support uh, from our um, judicial um, and the Ministry of Justice, uh, who very wisely ruled uh, that it's not a wiretappable uh, communication. It's not uh, communication as per uh, wiretapping uh, rules because it must be deleted in 28 days. And uh, a wiretapping usually goes on uh, and retained for at least six months. And um, evidently, because of different data retention necessities, they, they are not the same thing. 
Uh, and, and that's a very clean legal argument that I cannot make uh, myself. And I, I'm not aware of any other jurisdiction making this argument, right? In Australia and Singapore and South Korea, you, usually they, they reason along a, a kind of a balance uh, doctrine, right? You have to have this sense of proportion. So for very serious crimes, you can then use some contact tracing data because the public benefit, the life saved, uh, and, and things like that. But no, it, it was just like that. Uh, no, the civic tech people said is for contact tracing only and the nature of the virus says that if you keep it for more than four weeks it doesn't make sense anymore because that's uh, longer than the two two week transmission period so uh, it's even like the RNA uh, properties of the virus determines uh, the data retention period which means that it conforms to a different norm and I think it's a celebration of diversity and plurality the collaboration across Absolutely. diversity that he's saying that the public health has its own logic. We should not force it to commensurate right? with crime investigation. And I think it's a beautiful legal argument. Oh, yeah. Somebody, it must be a relief to you to find like thinking minds mm -hmm. out there when you're throwing this stuff out there and somebody <laughs> says, yeah, that, mm -hmm. let's do that. And mm -hmm. you're going, whoa, that's a surprise. Mm -hmm. So, and from that, I mean, uh, here's a couple more of your quotes. Because everybody, uh, when I try to explain you to people, it's like, mm -hmm. it's got to be hackable. Mm -hmm. And your quote is, how to negotiate with the virus of the mind. Thinking together is the vaccine. The collective is immune to divisive campaigns. Mm -hmm. So it's back to this capillary action. People are not involved. And you even pointed out that the nature of data coming at you mm -hmm. is better. So you have, well, we need this data. Well, we also have, because we care, universal health care. Mm -hmm. So that transfers across platforms easily. Mm -hmm. And people see that it works. And now it's not Big Brother. It's your one of your mm -hmm. great original quotes. I'm not mm -hmm. here to make citizens mm -hmm. transparent to government. I'm here to make uh, government utterly transparent to citizens. Mm -hmm. And the more, they, the more they build this, the less hackable that mm -hmm. it is. Are you confident that, Taiwan is out, has broken through that hackable sound bar barrier that you're in a now a safe place that you can take additional steps. Mm -hmm. or are you still having to watch your back? I mean, if it's hackable, uh, we're already gone, right? Because they, there are like literally thousands of uh, attempted, not just cybersecurity, but information manipulation uh, attacks uh, toward Taiwan. Um, right. So, so we're um, battle hardened, right? That's the, the word. Uh, so, so, and and I think that's why people. Um, trust um the for example the estonian x-row system because again they yes. have um some nearby jurisdictions that um actually did take a lot of work to to hack into their systems so it's a, it's an analogous right. situation between china right. and russia you, know, right. you had so, people right. pounding on you from the outside right, right. so so it's not it, it's not a theoretical or armchair uh, argument basically what we have to design with the assumption that it will probably get hacked uh, one way or another. So it's defense in depth, right? So just hacking one uh, layer doesn't harm the other layer and you get detected very easily. But also uh, because it can also be understood by white hat hackers who have a very strong incentive and interest in keep the system uh, functioning well, right? Which is why Bitcoin doesn't suffer from many cybersecurity incidents uh, because, well, it's, it's they are very heavily incentivized uh, to keep it secure everybody who hold a stake uh in the in the system so even though you know nothing is encrypted uh on bitcoin it's it's just a digital signature ledger it's not encrypted at all uh still it's it's very um unhackable in a in a uh, cyber security sense so that the more transparent you are and the more people are interested and incentivized in keeping this model going the less likely uh, that we will fall victim uh so this is the complete opposite with the security through obscurity uh, mindset. Right. Very good. So um, I've watched a number of your videos where there mm -hmm. are any number of people from the West leaning forward in their chairs, struggling to figure out mm -hmm. how to do the crawl, walk, run thing mm -hmm. in the West. And it's interesting to me that uh, the people fighting the hardest, Taiwan, Estonia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ukraine, are the people that have living memory of authoritarianism. Yep. And one of your quotes is, uh, People often ask me about the future of democracy. To me, democracy's future is based on a culture of listening. Mm 
-hmm. Taiwan has no legacy systems mm -hmm. of representative democracy. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop uh, there with that quote. But mm -hmm. when you look at the West, mm -hmm. I had always looked at the West, and we I mentioned this before, that we've got the uh, there's this arrogance in the West about, well, we had the Magna Carta, mm -hmm. and if you're not blooded into the Magna Carta mm -hmm. or Demonstices and, and, and Greek mm -hmm. de democracy, you're not going to make it. And mm -hmm. yet there is a, what I've always seen as roots, I'm now seeing as legacy, mm -hmm. as perhaps decay. And mm -hmm. there's so much power. And there's also scale, which is a whole other question. I spent a bunch of time in Estonia, mm -hmm. and I went uh, to their... Uh, their State of the Union address, right when, right after the the Soviets had, uh, you know, they had their rocks up with the attack, and it was just President Rutel with mm -hmm. one camera and one microphone mm -hmm. talking to twelve thousand people in the in the arena, and it was a State of the Union. He said, mm -hmm. "Here's what's going on," as opposed to the circuses that the larger companies go to. And I thought, okay, wow, three million people, twenty three million people in Taiwan, that's a scale. So let's sit with this. We'll circle back to the idea of, of Western. Do you, when you look at Taiwan, mm -hmm. you go, yeah, 23 million people. That's about right. 200 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we can do this. How would mm -hmm. you break that down? Do you, do you think in terms of scalability and things working or not working? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think mostly uh, about whether there's a critical mass of mutual trustworthiness. Yes. That, that That's is the phrase. That is the, the, the phrase. Uh, above that critical mass, like just you, you cannot go wrong. Like anything goes, really. Um, I, I, I said it's a, a widened corridor uh, of freedom, right? So uh, th this idea from Ashimoglu and and friends, right? There's this very narrow corridor uh, where the state capacity and the civic capacity are just balanced so that they can trust each other and you cannot move easily um, unilaterally. Right from the state or the civic sectors without the other parties coordination because otherwise it will feel like you're decimating uh, the, the other parts, right? You're either, uh, you know, putting on lockdowns uh, or you're occupying the parliament uh, in a in this decidedly nonviolent way here, but not in other advanced countries. So anyway, the, the point here, what I'm trying to make is that unilateral action <laughs> along the state side or the civic side uh, are, are considered dangerous because the corridor is narrow. But that right. corridor is narrow because the critical mass of trustworthiness has not been reached. But if you have collective peak experiences together, like occupying the parliament in a nonviolent right. way that resulted in something endorsed by all the major parties, then the corridor right. is wide enough so that the state, when we try something like the contact tracing system, we don't immediately get demonized. But then immediately we have to, of course, uh, set up the reverse accountability, the judicial interpretation so to balance the civic side. But we get to make that unilateral move. And, and then the civic people, when they start mass demonstrations, uh, saying that, oh, we fork the government, but, but with love. <laughs> we, we do right. not feel threatened uh, that uh, the people protesting on the street says uh, the, the Environmental Protection Agency is hiding numbers. Our PM 2.5 census show that the air pollution is much worse than, than, than you said. And, and the EPA can actually say, uh, okay, let's work together. Let's calibrate. Let's work on the distributed ledger. Let's work on each other's models. The, the shortcomings you see in the industrial areas, let's just take your air boxes and install it on the lamps in industrial parks. And so, so it becomes very natural for the civic uh, to act unilaterally, right? To kind of prove the government wrong, but the government's instinct would be, oh, let's co-create. So we widen the corridor. So uh, I think the focus here must be on making this peak experience. Yuval Harari repeatedly said, if the social sector, the communities work against the pandemic when the state capacity fails, is properly recognized and amplified, maybe then post pandemic, people will have much more common things to talk about. But if it's just lockdowns and uh, you know, um, unilateral um, you know, state surveillance or things like that, then that will become normalized in some jurisdictions. So let's circle back then to these, mm -hmm. all these people from all these countries on the front of their seat, trying to figure out how to create this moment. Mm -hmm. And the whole, I mean, you flew back from the U.S. for the mm -hmm. Sunflower. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, mm -hmm. you weren't just watching on TV and going, good luck, guys. I mean, mm -hmm. you went back and you plopped yourself down and mm -hmm. you helped manifest this, this critical mass or this critical moment mm -hmm. that flipped this over. 
what advice do you have for the for Western people stuck mm -hmm. with any number of legacy systems mm -hmm. where I mean, do you know who Nina Jankowicz is? Mm -hmm. Do you know that name? Rings a bell. She, but, mm -hmm. she was the a homeland in the US, the mm -hmm. Homeland Security disinformation officer for mm -hmm. Homeland Security that that was derailed by misinformation. Uh, how to lose the information our, war. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, she was just mm -hmm. trying to I mean, yeah, one the, of her things was I'm with FEMA. Mm -hmm. Here's here's right. That's exactly her. Mm -hmm. Um she got blown out of her uh, out of her nomination process by misinformation. Uh -huh. So that was a very narrow box that was, I just want to make sure people in disasters know where the food is, where the blankets are, where to stay away from. This is the kind of very concrete disinformation or misinformation I'm interested uh -huh. in. So that foothold didn't work. It worked in maybe Iceland, Spain's got some stuff going on, and of course Estonia, but what advice has seemed to have worked when all these people from the Western countries come and say, what, where do we start? Because I really thought FEMA would be perfect. Disasters, real-time data that works, that's valuable. And it didn't. So ha has anything worked for other people that you've gone, hey, this, this is a nice little uh, turnkey for these other democracies that are trying to break into real time? But there's a, a lot of different uh, strengths here, right, in, in the question you just asked. Uh, I'll just pick one. Um, I, I would say a lot of this, when you call it a governance board, it, it sounds like people already have wide uh, rough consensus on what governance is. And so the, the work is mostly just the members of this board carrying out the, the governance, right? But but we, we didn't quite do that in 2017. Uh, we didn't set a disinformation governance board. Um, and, uh, the, and the reason why was that we, we really want to only focus on information manipulation. That is to say, it's not just false, right. but rather it right. it's it has a harmful intent. It it, it intends to cause social harm, uh, and and the reason why that instead of a broader disinformation or even broader mis and disinformation is the focus, was because without this shared urgency and clarity of purpose, the the word governance just just means very little. It means almost nothing, or it has a, a negative meaning, meaning that people look at that word and then think very different things. So the governance has become even less uh, possible, right? So, so, so I think um, it, it's, it's about not a arbiter of truthworthiness or trustworthiness. It's not even about being an arbiter. Uh, it is more about some way to build civic journalism capacity, digital competence into each and every person's, no matter what their political affiliation. People want to follow their favorite partisan YouTuber covering the counting of the, the, the count because they went to vote. They want to know that the count counts, right? So, so how to make the uh, YouTubers of very different party affiliations all agree that uh, transparency in the counting process, what should it look like? That is the first step of the uh, competence in digital and media competence. And obviously it reduces harm, no matter which ideological position you are in, because kind of by definition, right? If you're, you're, you're harmed by people counting the votes, you're, you're probably not part of the, the Commonwealth, uh, right? The, the, the um, democracy, right? So people who want their counts to count is the common de denominator when it comes to uh, election, uh, like fair uh, coverage. But if you go uh, even just a little bit beyond those purely factual things and this uh, concerted um, information manipulation that want to um, harm the public. If you just go a little bit more than that and step into like the newsroom fact checking regime, we, we don't even do that in Taiwan. We don't even right. think about doing that in Taiwan. We, we said this is entirely for the professional journalistic community. It's not the state's uh, capacity or it's not the state's mandate to, to arbitrate Wonderful. journalism. So, so I right. think there's a, a delineation here, that demarcation here, that I wouldn't say that the Taiwan model is obviously right, but that is one strand that we work 
and walked very carefully back in 2016-17. Yes. I I have two more questions. Are we good? Uh, you can not I mean I can go on for hours. Yeah, but yes. <laughs> I've I can go on for days. So, um, well, one thing that I don't think we can get into right now, but if we substitute the word scale uh -huh. for power. Uh-huh. Then now we're talking about because once you start mucking around in somebody's, you know, uh, once you're goring somebody's ox, uh, and you a lot of these Western countries are incredibly powerful, so it's not the question you you're stepping, you know, as they as they said, uh, what was the phrase? Don't rub another man's rhubarb, Batman. Mm -hmm. You know, that's once you're stepping in, you're taking some somebody's power. Hmm. That's another question that can be substituted for scale. And that's what we run into in the West is that you're in order to give power to the people mm -hmm. and get people involved on this level that you're talking about, mm -hmm. somebody else has to give up power. No, it's and, not the case. No. Okay. So uh, help me out all. there. Not at all. Uh, so, I mean, there, there's power and there's power, right? Uh, you, what, what you're talking about is, is more like um, power that is stored in barrels of oil. Uh, which, um, well, nowadays is very geopolitically important, but I, I'm mostly interested in this rivers, um, rivers uh, aspect. So if you have one barrel, that means somebody else somewhere else uh, have one less barrel of oil to make well, If power. I may, it, yeah. if I may, the power mm -hmm. I'm talking about is that yeah. there are some people saying, um, I can, if I can keep these people angry and morally outraged, uh -huh. then I can do these things that keep me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Yes. And so what yeah. happened in the positional stat status power right within a, a network uh, of beliefs or within an institution. Right. So so you're talking about market power, institutional power uh, yes. that is um, uh, based on information asymmetry or um, like yes. computational asymmetry. There's also the asymmetry uh, that enable uh, a asymmetrical relationship, right? Things that anarchists uh, don't do, right? right? <laughs> the, the, the opposite of anarchism. So, um, uh, but but my point here is um, that that's not the only only kind of power. Um, uh, Lao Tzu talks about uh, in Tao Te Ching, uh, mysterious power. Uh, and, and mysterious power uh, is something else uh, in, entirely. Uh, but but I, I don't want to now sound uh, like a Zen or, or, or Taoist guru, right? So, so I'll just use some Western uh, thought patterns instead. Uh, it, this is what uh, Manuel Castells called network making power uh, in his uh, theory of power uh, in the, the book Communication Networks and, and many other uh, related works after that. So the, the, the point I'm making is that if you focus on network making power, that is to say the power that is created like the internet, that doesn't take away the power of sysops the system operators of the institutional networks that operate the internet, um, but rather focus on the, the interchange layer, the TCP IPs, domain name systems, and so on, that to each participant, uh, to each institutional sysop participant, it increased their power vis-a-vis -vis, um, other institutions. But at the same time, uh, it made that power distributed, meaning that if you don't like your telecom provider, uh, and you don't um, want to be holden to that asymmetric information and computation, uh, there's now a lot more possibility around the world that can provide a, a more fair service to you that you will then be able to route uh, outside of your, uh, unless you're landlocked uh, or uh, sea locked, but then even then there's uh, Starlink and folks uh, that you can then uh, go to a different uh, dimension. So increasing uh, going to your opening, increasing the dimension uh, of uh, possibilities. That is what network making power do. And in doing that, we're operating on a very different uh, idea of scaling vertically. We're not even scaling horizontally. This is more like right. scaling deeply uh, and, and scaling deeply like like fashion, like uh, norms and so on, operates on, on a cultural a mimetic um, sphere that is unrelated to the uh, institutional power, which is why uh, uh, 
what what I'm doing really, I, I always write digital ministry with a lowercase m, uh, because it's a it's really just 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 preaching, right? <laughs> Listening to confessions, I guess, right? This is this uh, mimetic work, cultural work uh, that is unrelated uh, to the uppercase ministry, uh, which is giving orders and, and giving uni unilateral command and things like that. So so I, I think, um, but it does take it does take um, a um, a strong alignment to not wanting to make a mock to the world, to someone who practiced this very Taoist way of, of power making, because at the time you, you give in to your personal urge to leave a mark to the world, then that's when you think institutional modes of exchange, top-down hierarchies become um, very useful uh, and uh, powerful. And, and then once you think that is powerful, then you lose the trustworthiness that's required for the network model and the community model um, to, to run. So I think this, this inner peace of making peace of not doing anything of Wu Wei, that is actually the key to make this non-competitiveness work vis-a-vis -vis existing power networks. So go ahead and take a shot at being the Zen guru. You said you, <laughs> you did a Western thought power, uh, thought pattern. Take, go ahead and work the Eastern side of it. Because okay. this is a very important point that you're making. What you're, what you're sort of saying is like, okay, so they figured out the shadows even better in Plato's cave, these people are mesmerized. They're not just shadows, they're holograms. We can't figure out how to break through this constant stream of disinformation mm -hmm. to start to have this moment that Audrey uh, enjoyed at the Sunflower Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so go ahead, take a shot at-, at oh, Okay, at, okay, at, all right. I, this, is, this is when I start to recite all that thing. Um, so 10 techniques. Go for it. Um, can you keep your soul in its body, hold fast to the one, and so learn to be whole? Can you center your energy, be soft, tender, and so learn to be a baby? Can you keep the deep water still and clear, so it reflects without blurring? Can you love people and run things, and do so by not doing, opening, closing the gate of heaven. Can you be like a bird with her nestlings, piercing bright through the cosmos? Can you know by not knowing, to give birth, to nourish, to bear, and not to own, to act and not lay claim, to lead and not to rule? This is mysterious power. Wow, that was, uh, I, I love the title that you're not a politician, you're a poetician. Uh -huh, yeah. And there it is, that's beautiful. Um, to the children. Uh -huh. So uh, part of what you're doing and getting this trust and building this ongoing real-time dialogue, uh -huh. a country of people talking to themselves, um, the whole air quality Mm -hmm. uh, effort is is downright brilliant and mm -hmm. you you know and again we'll talk about it in the show notes and i love two of your quotes mm -hmm. uh, it is impossible to teach but easy to learn mm -hmm. that kind of fits in with your poetry mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. and that's one of your lines and like flowers they already know how to grow it's about nurturing in their direction mm -hmm. so do you have right now the children in these schools are overseeing the the air quality mm -hmm. yeah. of Taiwan. Yes. And they're also fact checking presidential mm -hmm. elections. Yes. So do you have uh so they are getting uh, data savvy on mm -hmm. every level. Again, mm -hmm. you couldn't teach that, but it's hands on. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to get your hands on there and that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. Is do you see a next step for the children or for for making people digitally data uh stewards, making them good stewards and and helping Taiwan as it grows. Yeah, um, I, I talk about the the kind of idea thon, right? The twenty forty researchers, speculative designers, science fiction um, work uh, in the uh, next half year, starting September, uh, and very early in the brainstorming process, we realized that all the school children, especially primary school age, 
is a natural science fiction speculative designer uh, because they're, they're not bounded uh, by the by the institutional um, whatever business as usual uh, is uh, in their life experience they have not experienced the learned helplessness uh, of things they're not constrained uh, by the the old uh, technological um, upper bounds uh, and limitations and so to to them um, it, it's natural to think about 2040 because you know by by 2040 they're the adult uh, part of the society right it's natural to to think about that so um i, I think we, we really need to uh, move the agenda setting stage from previously um, maybe 17 years old, 15 years old, um, nowadays more to the 10 years old or to the eight years old, uh, and then uh, we we're and then we're talking uh, because then we're, when we're talking about a long enough horizon with a unbounded and limited imagination, maybe some of the best um, immersive experiences will be in in some uh, wild idea speculation of eight years old, right? So uh, I think that is the direction we're going. We, we don't know what will unfold, uh, but we will find out collectively. We have a marvelous poet, William Stafford, mm -hmm. and he, one of his lines, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to blow it, but it was something like, it is so many years until they learn that there is uh, anything that isn't music. Mm -hmm. And the other one, uh, which comes to my next question, is the the darkness is deep around us. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'd like to talk about the future what you see for the future mm -hmm. and a couple more of your quotes once people get the idea that you don't need a government to do governance then people get into the true spirit of collabor collaborative governance mm -hmm. it may take a generation or more for people to see the state as a useful illusion and only use that illusion whenever convenient mm -hmm. and then i really i i had thought i understood ubuntu before listening to you but the idea mm -hmm. of completing each other as in mm -hmm. the pieces of a puzzle um so you don't have to get tangled up in marx or hegel or teleologies mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. deep that's one of the things i love about mm -hmm. you is that you mm -hmm. don't there's you know you, you don't get mired in these depths of of mm -hmm. of, of i don't know what you call a mental gymnastics philosophical hermeneutics yeah <laughs> well it's there and it's beautiful <laughs> and you know but but the idea of ubuntu is very mm -hmm. simple yeah. it's like for this to work for taiwan to work for people to become immune to the kind of misinformation, moral outrage, mm -hmm. it's because they're incomplete. Yeah. It's because there's something else mm -hmm. chewing away at them and yeah. that they are susceptible to these other things. That's, you mm -hmm. know, the moral outrage is, is the final mm -hmm. symptom. It's not the, it's not the disease. Mm -hmm. So uh, the key to well-being is connectiveness and digital mm -hmm. technology connects people to people. And then I love your AI play here. Assistive intelligence, AI, mm -hmm. can become antisocial space, also AI, authoritarian intelligence, mm -hmm. which we talked a little about. Mm -hmm. Empower individuals to be connected, therefore increasing well-being, not users, but valued customers capable of co-creation. Mm -hmm. So when you and Yuval were talking, and I've read other of Yuval's stuff, I love his take on, okay, so we create imaginary stories and then we believe them. So you have to uh, don't get trapped in your own story and make sure you create the right mm -hmm. story. Yeah. So one of his points uh, is that human beings dominate the planet because we can organize stories. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. but the problem mm -hmm. is, is that th what motivates it is always some weird story. It's mm -hmm. always a myth. It's always a nation. Mm -hmm. And that here we are at the crossroads. Mm -hmm. where we must organize mm -hmm. around science and facts, climate mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. We have to organize around this new story. We've mm -hmm. never done it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it. It's new territory. And mm -hmm. so already you're thinking in terms of 2040, mm -hmm. 2050, mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the illusion of governance and anarchy mm -hmm. and getting rid of unjustified hierarchies, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you're talking about, and this is what's great about Ubuntu, I don't know if you're talking about mm -hmm. evolution or more perfectly and better completion, Yeah, which it's is both. a, a it's less both. loaded term. Yeah, yeah. So what, mm -hmm. talk to me about what you, you know, look in your crystal ball. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've thought about it. Yeah. What, what do you see? Mm -hmm. Because if I may, there's one mm -hmm. more thing. I think the path that you're on mm -hmm. is, is the path to what Yuval is saying we must go on right, the, the uh, sapient you're, shit. You're, yes uh -huh. yes i love that word uh -huh. you're on the path what 
how do you see this unfolding? Taiwan's on its path. You see twists and turns in the river that mm -hmm. still need to happen. What would you like to share with us about that? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think of evolution, I think less about this industrial age imagination of survival of the fittest, but I think more of uh, how previously barely organic stuff uh, started to become multicellular and to uh, develop this, this very sophisticated uh, chemistry, like literally chemistry, uh, between them and then uh, life forms are, are formed, right? So I think organization, social coordination wise, we're, we're not at the, you know, um, um, apes and cheetahs and tigers <laughs> stage of things. We're, we're very much still in the, I think, uh, single cellular, multicellular, uh, organic life form uh, stage of things. That is to say, uh, while we have very sophisticated connectivity, technological capability, uh, the social organizations, the social innovators uh, are still, as you said, repeating uh, the old stories of learned helplessness, right? So it is so becoming a, it's not a, just a, a routine. Uh, it's a, it's a trip that has been going on for too long. It's a learned bad trip. helplessness. Right. <laughs> right. So if you stay in the learned helplessness uh, for too long, it's, it's like having your wings clipped, right? You don't even know you have wings anymore. And you hear uh, when I do contact tracing and you say it's impossible because it's learned helplessness, all right? It's well outside of your zone of not just comfort, but but visibility uh, in, in the imagination. So um, I think um, one must be quite Buckminster Fullerian about it, right? To, to just be a, a simple um, a starter of conversation of imagination uh, and then just to steer the, the wind a little bit toward a certain direction so that this very small but real peak experience can happen uh, between people who previously did not think that social technology is a sort of technology, uh, that social coordination across diversity is actually possible. Uh, and then from that personal experience, they, they grow, right? So it's not about uh, tr making troll controlled, it's about to help the trolls grow, right? Uh, to, to make sure that right. the trolls start telling uh, good stories uh, to, to each other. And I don't think uh, there's trolls and there's humans. It's not like it's a different state uh, species, right? A different stage of evolution. I don't think that I think it's mostly just there's this trollish side of us. Uh, there's the more uh, hum human care side of us. Uh, and as I mentioned, the the puzzle pieces need to find the other puzzle pieces where they're more trollish on the side that you know a a, a, a more humanistic uh, way of coordination exists, but they complement your more trollish, uh, your hurt, uh, your your uh, previous trauma of learned helplessness. And then by working together, uh, both of you are uh, liberated from the previous traumas. So you're almost talking about a teleology going back to biology, mm. that there's mm. this there's this uh, millennial, if not millions of years of organization, uh, systems, mm -hmm. co coordinating, evolving, as loaded a word as that is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is, do you believe in teleology? Do you think we're, mm -hmm. you don't think we're unimprovable mammals? Mm -hmm. Do you think we can but I, I, I know, I know uh, neuroplasticity is real. Yes, right? I, I've right? been neuroplastic myself. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is, this is not a leap of faith. This, this actually happened uh, to, to me. I, I worked uh, very closely uh, with um, like the French uh, psychoanalysts uh, for, for years, uh, spending like 45 minutes every day, uh, four days a week, uh, either on the couch in, in Paris or through uh, tele <coughs> uh, psychoanalysis. Um, and really that there's this technique of neuroplasticity that one can just look at uh, one's uh, circuits uh, mentally uh, and then learn not to identify with it and then build a, um, what we call a cell function, right? A function of um, Yvette, my psychoanalyst, uh, as represented by a iPad uh, in my mind uh, so that now when I uh, fall back into any old habits, I also have a habit of building new habits uh, of a, a neuroplastic <laughs> uh, habit, right? That, that's that a great is, habit. Right, that, that is the, the psychoanalyst in my mind. So, 
So it is possible. I have gone through it. I have not done psychoanalysis as an analyst, but I understand the, the basic theory. So yeah, this is a lot like how Fayer Arbent, right, with the alternative medicine, right, informed as anything goes, uh, science philosophy, because there are uh, peak experiences, both individually as a dyad, as two people, as a group uh, that we can then mentally anchor to, so that to form neuroplastic uh, habits in all of our, ourselves. I, I think the dawn of everything by Greba is, is just like painting this retro story of, you know, the human civilization has been doing that all along, and it's a great book. In, in English, the word empathy doesn't pop up until the early 1900s. Uh -huh. And I'm going to do a podcast with our wonderful uh, state poet. Her name's Paisley Rechtal. Uh -huh. And she, her take is that it wasn't, Books didn't seem to quite do it. It wasn't until movies mm. that you could sit and look at someone else's life without them looking back yeah. at you yeah. that it emerged. There's uh, that's when empathy comes in yeah. and with empathy comes uh, it's something that if I may uh, that you mentioned in another mm -hmm. uh in another interview that having gone through two puberty yeah. mm -hmm. had had made you very mm -hmm. empathetic. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. there anything you'd like to address about that things mm -hmm. that you learned in those two journeys, sort of weaving those two journeys together and going, mm -hmm. wow, I know something that 99.9% .9 of humanity doesn't understand. No, no, I know something that 99 uh, percent of people do understand, which is their own puberty. Right? So I, I think that's that's the, the difference in 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 seeing things. I, I don't say uh, I'm the person who went through pu to puberties. I, I'm more like uh, whomever you are when we're having this conversation. Uh, I, I'm more like uh, wh whatever you've gone through. There's something that I've gone through, and let's just focus on that part, right? So so I, I wouldn't yeah. just just say things just to to be to be cool to to show off to say oh i've gone through this you haven't uh it's the other way around i never thought that <laughs> right. <to be> clear. <laughs> yeah but it's the other way around so so uh but what i'm trying to say is that the intersectionality is not about uniqueness intersectionality is about uh constant bridge building uh from shared lived experiences and a willingness of saying, oh, if you are someone who I don't even know how to begin building empathy, maybe that's my problem and I need to uh, hang out with you more. I need to do a ethnographic, well, really just hang out with your group uh, journey uh, together so that I can also see the world from your side. So it's a open invitation. It's not like uh, I'm so unique. I combine like 17 multitude uh, sustainable goals. Uh, it, it's more like whatever your goal is, uh, let me sustain it with you. Uh, that's the, 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 the difference that I'm trying to, to paint. Wow. So to finish up with this mm -hmm. quote, mm -hmm. um, to me, democracy's future is based on a culture of listening. And that you and you and then uh, the president siding when I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. At her inauguration three years ago, she said, before democracy was a showdown between two opposing values. Now democracy is a conversation between many diverse values. And you ask the question, is this scalable learning? Is, uh, <clears throat> I, I'll cut that out. Is this listening scalable? Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the key. And I think, think this listening uh, yeah. is scalable. I think learning is scalable. I, I like your way of... of putting this, um, because learning as skill is, it's much more um, dynamic, right? When, when you're saying listening as skill, that, that's the word that I used to use, uh, but that was before this whole um, Cambridge Analytica thing. And, and, oh my goodness, and, right. and, and suddenly listening a skill takes a very e echelon, right, <laughs> quality to it. Because, right. Right, because it, pr previously it takes something active to listen. So uh, passive data collection is not the same as active listening as skill. But Cambridge Analytica and information and emotion manipulation is a kind of listening as skill because it's a active participant 
in the dialogue it it tried to like active listener enlist you to to say more things about yourself uh but unlike a psychoanalyst right which is doing this strictly uh for the assistive uh purposes to to restore or help on your dignity um this is uh the the cambridge analytica is trying to dehumanize you commodify you so that they become the only buyer of your attention and monopsony uh buyer uh, of your attention so that you don't talk to anyone else, you just talk to them. So they listen to skill, but your speech is no longer a skill. Uh, the agency is taken taken out. So after that, I still say listening as skill, but I uh, always say millions of people listen to one another as skill instead of one person listen to millions of people because that part became like very very difficult to defend after cambridge analytica so uh i, I think the the point i'm making is that but when you're saying uh one person learning from millions of people that that still works right because it is obvious that whatever i learn from you uh it's it's anti-rival right it's not like i'm learning about uh, your viewpoints like this way of saying uh, scalable learning uh, to to um, sell it uh, to to some advertisers so that you, you see more learning advertisements uh, in your uh, Google stream or whatever. Right? Obviously, when I say learning, it means that um, I improve myself, I improve my <clears throat> worldview. So it's it's much more dynamic, it's much more dyadic. Um, and so, yeah, maybe maybe I'll, I'll switch to say scalable learning from from now on, because um, in learning, one is listening, but one is not just listening, it's listening with a purpose, a purpose based learning, uh, and then project based learning, problem based learning, and so on. But first, the purpose and learning is, I think, one of the great purposes that unites the, the sapientship together. So you're hopeful. Yeah, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Yeah. There you go. Hey, Angie, my wife has been watching. Angie, have you got a question for Audrey after all this? She just got her PhD in the exact kind of learning that you're talking about. Excellent. Yeah. Angie, I, you want to pop up? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was very interested in talking in, in what you were saying. Um, I studied uh, using a special kind of analysis called epistemic network analysis, which mm -hmm. looks at the networks between people and how they how they relate. So it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, where I think when when I introduced this idea of a reflective space on open data, I liken it to the reflective telescopes. Um, pri prior to reflective telescope, people wasn't even sure that the traditional telescopes, uh, Saturn or whatever, is real. Uh, like wh whether it's objects of knowledge is disputed. Uh, and that's partly, of course, the instruments are not well understood, but also because the cultures around the proper use of those instruments are not um, calibrated uh, enough uh, across uh, societies of knowledge. So I think a lot of the work I think we're, we're imagining here or actually doing on the ground um, is just to calibrate the, the context so that the telescopes or microscopes or other scopes become properly part of our uh, epistemic um, fabric uh, instead of just by these selected few and then everybody else have no clue and, and then there's a natural divide uh, between the, the people who say they're the fact checkers and the people who say but that's not fact checking. Mm -hmm. But see, and that's the beauty of you, Audrey, is that this is an academic conversation. Mm -hmm. You are doing these things oh well, yeah i'm, I'm and... the trim tap trim tap i'm afraid but yes <laughs> i'm literally the trim tap <laughs> so that is uh astonishing the world is a better place for you uh mm -hmm. audrey mm -hmm. and i don't know if you have anything else that's on your mind that you'd like to say mm -hmm. i just want to give you the floor for a minute if there's something that you'd like to cap this off with Mm -hmm. You've been incredibly yeah. generous with your time. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and which is why it took so so long because uh, I, I wanted to give this conversation my undivided attention, and uh, it, it took quite a oh. few months for for me to schedule this this block of time. I'm so grateful. Sure, uh, and me too. Like mutually, um, I, I think uh, I think a, a lot of what we talked about. I understand you, you phrase your questions so that people feel that there's something tangible 
that's something that actually exists uh, on this world and uh, that this learned helplessness is not the end or be all of things that the, the agency toward um, learning a skill uh, is is within reach basically uh, which is which is very good and and I just just want to say uh, that um, maybe it's not about emulating uh, whatever we did in Taiwan. Maybe, as I mentioned uh, to the uh, new local folks in the UK, if it feels better uh, for you to call it the New Zealand model, uh, call it the New Zealand model, don't call it the Taiwan model, because for, for the British people to, to prepare for the next pandemic, um, ideologically-wise, uh, New Zealand feels closer, but uh, it's exactly the same model. So what I'm trying to say is that um, maybe this conversation is the beginning, of a an inspiration. Uh, however, um, find something that is closer in shared experience, in shared challenges, uh, and then and in closer time zones, uh, and just start small. Uh, and more often than not, when your scale is not 23 or 2 million, but 2,000, like literally your community, uh, this works very quickly. You can very quickly see uh, the dynamic change, the the trim tab, right? The the community doesn't go go uh, by you and ignoring you. You can just change the way you think, and then two hundred or two thousand people changes just like that immediately. And that's the peak experience that I was uh, keep referring to. Uh, I'm certainly yes. not saying that it must start to work on the network a scale of twenty three million. It's interesting that we managed to make this scale work, but most of my learning when I was eight years old, full of imagination, uh, was just a, at a consumer co-op that is maybe just 20 people. But still, I learned a lot with the co-op with just 20 people. Audrey Tang, you, uh, if, if you ever come to the US, come mm -hmm. visit us. Design National Park is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Mm -hmm. And we would welcome you and, and uh, embrace you and take care of you bless you audrey tang thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time and your incredible thoughts mm -hmm. thank you uh, and live long and prosper